ghosts inside. Day one. Today I awoke to the sound of screams. It was 3 a.m. I wasn't completely aware of what was happening in the world around me. It was pitch black in my room. I quickly jumped from my bed and frantically searched for the light switch. I turned on the lights and could not believe my eyes. There was nothing. The room was exactly as it was before. Nothing misplaced, exactly the same. I walked to the window that stared down to the street from my third story apartment. The night was calm, nothing out of the ordinary. But what were those screams? I probably just imagined them. I went back to sleep. Day two. This morning there were no screams, just soft voices. But these voices did not go away. I tried my best to ignore them. I went through my day. As the day progressed, the voices grew louder and harder to ignore. I reached a point at which I couldn't stand it any longer. I screamed, stop it. Everyone stared at me with eyes of worry and confusion. I fainted. Day three. What the hell is going on? I asked myself. The voices in my head were so loud as ever and only worsening, but that is not the worst of the matter. I awoke to a frightening sight. Somehow I was at my bed in my apartment, but above me was a woman hung by a noose. My heart stopped as I stared at the woman for what felt like hours, waiting for something to happen. I tried to move out of my bed, but as soon as I tried, the woman grabbed my arm and screamed. Her scream sounded familiar, but there was no time to think. I was unable to release myself from a tight grasp. I ran, I ran as fast as I could. I could feel something eerie trailing not far behind me. I was too scared to look. The time to me was unknown. It was not complete day outside, but neither night. It was the twilight point of the day. I sprinted for as long as I could. I decided to stop to catch my breath. Big mistake. Whatever was behind me caught up. I couldn't bring myself to scream fear enveloped my lungs. I could feel my chest tightening. I couldn't move. I felt bony fingers wrap around my shoulders, a cold breath on my neck. It spun me around with an unexpected might. There it was. I saw its face. It was the woman. I stared deeply into her eyes and understood. I blacked out. Day four, I now understand all that I was feeling. All the screaming was her, it was her all along. With all the others, the ones from the other world. They were communicating with me from my inside. They wanted to tell me what to do. They need me to provide a mortal to them. Even ghosts need to feast but who to choose of the millions out there perhaps the ones sitting on their computer right now reading this article yes that will do The Blood Keeper I live in a small 
but lively town in Massachusetts. Its local legends have fueled my love affair with the paranormal. It's a subject that fascinates me to this day. Coupled with insomnia, this passion led me to spend many a night at the nearby cemetery, hoping to see a ghostly apparition while walking through to pass the time. These outings were unfruitful, void of all activity, supernatural or otherwise. My dream of stealing a glimpse at what comes after eventually subsided, but I continued to visit the graves. It was a place where I could collect my thoughts when sleep eluded me. One night, however, something changed. It was a dark spring evening. I was bored, couldn't sleep, and felt the need to do something outdoors in the cool night air, as it so often did. The local graveyard called out to me. I obliged, unable to resist the allure of its calming nature. Sometimes I was even tempted to set up camp there and sleep amongst the dead. Knowing this would be frowned upon and perhaps morbid, I settled for my walks. They were enough to make me at least somewhat weary by night's end. After a couple of hours there, I decided on one last stroll along the headstones in an attempt to become tired before heading home. Upon starting my walk, I noticed something. There was a light on in the groundskeeper's shack. It wasn't like him to be working so late. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary until you factored in the large gaping hole nearby, big enough for several caskets. It was a miracle I hadn't fallen into it earlier in the night. Curious as to what the old man was up to, I crept over to the shack, making my way to the busted window on its side. What I saw was strange. Inside were nine men wearing tattered blue shrouds, partaking in a makeshift feast. The main course was an oily red stew with a horrific smell that permeated the shack's walls and ventured up my nasal passages, tempting me to gag. The men winced when putting it to their lips, save for three, a tall man at the end of the table and the two sat beside him. When the feast was over, this tall figure stood up and addressed the room. Hello, newcomers. I hope dinner has been to your liking. He spoke with a firm voice. It resonated throughout the shack and beckoned even me to listen. Now that our bellies are full, Elijah will explain the rules of your impending trial. I listened closely. It seemed the men in the shack were part of a collective known as the Blood Lights. The trial the tall man spoke of was something akin to a medieval gladiator sport used to initiate new members. I listened as Elijah divulged the games in her workings, fearful but curious. Two teams were to disperse to opposite sides of the cemetery, each consisting of four members, three blood runners and one blood baron. The initiates would be the runners and the tall man's henchmen would act as barons. There was one more participant to be discussed. The tall man himself, he was the blood keeper. Though not on either team, he was the most crucial facet of the game. He kept and guarded 
what was referred to as the blood. I gathered that this referred to the red amulet hanging from the keeper's neck as he firmly clasped it every time the word blood was uttered. The job of the runners was to retrieve the blood from the keeper. The barons acted as council, overseeing each team and helping where needed. After Elijah finished his lecture, the blood keeper took over. With every wound there is blood, with every drop of blood there is solace. Without death there can be no light. The keeper opened a large cupboard in the corner of the shack, revealing a woman bound and gagged, futilely attempting to cry out for help. My heart sank. This was not your normal run-of-the-mill cult ritual. I had to find help. But what if they heard me? Unable to nail down my next course of action, I was immobile, frozen in fear. The blood keeper continued. The light of blood can only be seen in death. Pulling a large red dagger out from his cloak, he grabbed the woman and plunged it into her gut. I watched in horror as the life left her eyes. She began to shriek, but was soon cut off by a cut to the chest, followed by a final blow to her neck. I was mortified. After throwing his kill to the floor, the keeper pulled out three vials, filling each of them with the blood that dripped from his blade. This was what the blood runners were after, not the amulet. This is all the blood I have to offer that gives at most three of you the opportunity to become bloodlights. And remember, you are being watched. Those who fail to collect must be disposed of. The same goes for any outsider you encounter. Corpses are to be thrown in the pit. Dear God, I was truly in danger. That's what the nearby hole was for. The perfect hiding spot for a mass grave. You must stop at nothing to obtain one of these vials. All others will be sacrificed. Your thirst for blood must be as strong as your will to live. The men exited the shack to begin the trial. I scurried silently to the wooded part of the graveyard and hid behind a large tree. Not wanting to end up like that poor woman, I just needed an opening to escape without being noticed. Glancing out at the cemetery, I saw a runner knelt before a grave, eyes closed. I assumed this was a requirement before the game commenced. A perfect chance for me to make a run for it. Let the trial begin. The blood keeper's voice echoed through the trees before I could take even a single step towards safety. My survival still hung in the balance. Using a moonlit pool of water by my feet as a reflective surface, I watched as Elijah and three runners strategized just ten yards from my position. My heart was pounding so hard, I was worried they would hear it. Between the beating in my chest and the conspiring whispers that filled the forest, my ears were consumed with an unsettling symphony of torture. Just when I couldn't bear another moment, silence cut through the brisk night air like the keeper's dagger piercing that woman's skin. A chill then burrowed into my spine. The puddle's reflection bore no cloaked figures. Peering out from behind the tree confirmed they were gone, or at least nowhere to be seen. This was my chance. Looking off into the distance, I saw a tomb by the main road, maybe a hundred yards away. 
it would provide the perfect cover to escape towards civilization. But there was no way I could waltz over there without being seen. The woods wrapped around the cemetery, so running from tree to tree would strengthen my odds of survival. I took a deep breath and braced myself. Without so much as a second thought, I dashed to the next tree on the path to safety and took cover. I then gathered my wits and surveyed my surroundings. No cloaks in sight. I sprinted to the next tree and took another glimpse out at the world. The coast was still clear. As I was about to take off in the direction of my next hiding spot, panic set in as my feet inexplicably left solid ground. My blood ran cold as I was lifted into the air by some unseen force. The next thing I knew, my body was hoisted up and placed atop a tree branch. There I was greeted by the unnerving sight of my captor, a blood runner. I didn't scream or try to get away. It would be no use. I sat there in terror and exhaled what I thought would be my last breath. Instead of gutting me, the man spoke. What's your name? I was too shocked to respond. Come on now, who are you? He spoke clearer this time, revealing a slight English accent. Look, I noticed you at the window over there, eavesdropping. If I wanted you dead, I could have killed you then. I want you to help me. Help you? I asked. Yes, I'm going to use you to my advantage. I take it you know what we're doing here. You know the rules of the game. I nodded, slowly, still shook. Good. With you, I may be able to turn the tables and get the upper hand. I was frightened, but I calmed down enough to focus on the runner's plan. See that tomb over there? That's where the bloodkeeper is. My stomach turned. To think this guy may have just saved my life. I need you to go over to the tomb and open the door slowly. The bloodkeeper will surely take a swing at you, just as he's about to end your life. I'll swoop in and end his. But why? I asked. That's not part of the game. Right you are. You need not concern yourself with the why. Just know that if you don't do as I say, I will kill you myself. Now get going. The man gave me his cloak for protection and pushed me out of the tree. I didn't want to risk facing the bloodkeeper, but I didn't want to perish at the runner's hands either. My fear of dying kept me from deviating. I again ran from tree to tree, eventually making it to my destination. The stench of bloodshed wafting through the air as the runners fought for control of the field, with my back pressed to the cold, aged stone. The pull to escape grew, the main road was in reach, but the thought quickly subsided. I was far too worried the Englishman would catch up with me and take his price. He was able to climb a tree and lift my weight into it without a sound. It was clear he possessed the agility and strength needed to take me by surprise during a haphazard run for the hills. I sighed in defeat, knowing that one way or another, I would probably die that night. Mustering up every bit of courage I had, I crept around the tomb and faced its door. My shaking hands reached for the rusted handle and pulled it towards me. Before its hinges could even creak, 
At the motion, the door burst open, pushed from within. The force knocked me over, my head connecting with the unforgiving ground. The moments that came after remained fuzzy. The blood keeper towered over me, half of his body in shadow, the other half soaked in moonlight, a vision of death, there to steal the blood from my racing heart. My eyes grew weary and shut for an instant, before opening to see another figure. I couldn't make out who was who in my dazed state, but one attacked the other, completely overpowering them. The prey in this scuffle fell to his knees, before landing face first into the cold cemetery soil. The familiar sound of metal colliding with flesh rang through the air as the victor saw to it that the job was done. I prayed it was the blood keeper being torn apart, otherwise I was a goner. My eyes shut again before unconsciousness finally took hold. Hey, are you all right? I heard an old man's voice as I came to. Are you okay? I opened my eyes to see who it was. The groundskeeper stood over me, holding a lantern to my face. What? How? Where are they? Where's who? he asked. You don't understand. I should be dead. The groundskeeper stared at me, confused, but then smiled. Come on, you'll catch cold out here. The groundskeeper, who I now know to be Pete, invited me into his shack. He prepared some food and tossed me a blanket to keep warm. Thankful and in need of an ear to fill, I told him everything, despite how I knew it would sound. I didn't describe the men by their given titles, but Pete seemed to know who I was talking about. Sounds like you had a run-in with the Blood Keeper. That's him. How did you know? His spirit has been visiting these grounds for over a hundred years now, I suppose. His spirit. Incredible. It was all a haunting. Something I always thought I wanted to experience firsthand. Pete and I talked for a long while. He knew all about the bloodlights and their dastardly deeds. Apparently, they were a sadistic cult that formed in the 1800s, terrorizing the local community. Each bloodlight initiation brought with it more disappearances. They used the cemetery as a space for their trials, burying casualties and sacrifices at the end of the night. After all, who would look for the bodies in a graveyard? Over 50 souls fell victim to the bloodlights before their sinister games were brought to a halt. During their last outing, an Englishman infiltrated their ranks and killed the blood keeper, avenging the death of his wife, who had been murdered during one of their trials. Soon after, his disciples came forward, claiming to have been controlled by the keeper's amulet, alleging that it had supernatural powers. No such amulet was ever recovered. After Pete explained everything, I sat in awe, dumbstruck by the whole ordeal. Had I relived that fateful night? Or did I time travel and help that man fulfill his goal? I may never know what happened that day, but one thing is certain, I will never visit another cemetery for as long as I live, just in case the ghost of the Blood Keeper is still out there, making his rounds. (laughs) 
and that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thanks for listening. If you have any scary stories, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares and follow me on Twitter at home of scares. If you enjoyed tonight's video, then why not give it a like and subscribe and click the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, good night, my little hellhounds. Thank <laughs> you.